It's Antibiotic Awareness Week. We're tipping our hat with a new episode on antibiotic resistance, one of the biggest current threats to public health. That's the topic of this week's healthcare triage. Antibiotics are on the level of vaccines as pillars of modern medicine. Much of what we take for granted now wouldn't be possible without them. Common infections that used to be fatal are now easily vanquished with antibiotics, which weren't around a mere 80 or so years ago. Likewise, antibiotics make medical procedures like surgery and chemotherapy possible because they fight off bacteria in situations where the risk of infection is much, much higher. However, like all life forms, bacteria evolve. And in response to us attacking them with antibiotics, they evolve in ways which make them resistant to those attacks. They then pass on that resistance in various ways, and this cycle produces what are sometimes referred to as superbugs, or bacteria that are immune to every antibiotic we've got. This is terrifying, and it's on the rise. According to the CDC, antibiotic resistance is one of the most urgent threats to public health. Antibiotic resistant infections affect 2 million Americans every year, killing more than 20,000. A big part of the problem is overprescribing. We potentially contribute to antibiotic resistance every time we use antibiotics, which is why they should only be used when medically necessary, by which I mean when there's a bacterial infection to treat. One out of every three outpatient antibiotics is unnecessary. Overuse appears to be most common in urgent care clinics, though the problem is seen everywhere, including retail clinics, medical offices, and emergency departments. Another big contributor to resistance is the use of antibiotics in food animals like cattle. In 2017, up to 12 million pounds of antibiotics were used in this way. A recent report from the National Resources Defense Council gave only two food chains, Chipotle and Panera, an A grade of sourcing beef not raised with any antibiotics. Places like McDonald's and Subway received C grades for outlining them but not yet implementing policies on this. And places like Olive Garden and Domino's got F grades for having no policies at all. This is important because bacteria in animal intestines can become resistant, then multiply, and then make their way to humans via contaminated meat, contact with animal stool, or water that has come into contact with animal stool, and through touching or caring for animals. Currently, the FDA approves antibiotic use in food animals for disease treatment, control, and prevention. However, they are sometimes used for growth promotion or to increased feed efficiency, which is not necessary for animal health. So now we have these antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Pretty scary. Can we develop other antibiotics to treat them? We can, but currently we are not, at least not fast enough. A visualization tool from the Pew Charitable Trust, we'll include the link down below, demonstrates how few novel antibiotics are currently in development. According to Pew, there are only 42 antibiotics in clinical development, and not all of these will end up receiving FDA approval. Beyond that, there are three resistant bacteria in particular that the World Health Organization considers serious threats to public health, and of the antibiotics currently in the development phase, only 14 are potentially effective against infections caused by these rogue bacteria. So what's the holdup? Well, identifying new and potentially effective antimicrobial molecules, conducting the necessary experiments with them, and then taking them through clinical trials is an arduous process, and it doesn't always work out in the end. Beyond the initial step of discovering and screening thousands of molecules to determine which ones or which combinations and in what ways are capable of killing bacteria, there's finding the ones that do that without harming humans. This is not only tricky, it takes a really long time and it costs a lot of money. And after all that, new antibiotics are likely to be sold very sparingly, used to treat only the most resistant cases in order to avoid, to the best of our ability, exacerbating the current situation. The opportunity to invest a lot of time and money into a product that will be sold as sparingly as possible doesn't exactly have drug developers lining up at the door. Indeed, major pharmaceutical companies like Novartis are ending their antibiotic research and development programs. Without effective antibiotics, many life-saving procedures will become too risky, and even minor infections could be life-threatening. So what actions are being taken? Government organizations like the FDA and the CDC have laid out response plans. The FDA is working on a five-year plan addressing antibiotic use in food animals, and the CDC has detailed a national action plan that includes bolstering research on prevention, increasing and enhancing health surveillance, and adopting evidence-based stewardship strategies. The DISARM Act is a piece of legislation proposed to change the way Medicare pays for newer antibiotics. 
Fully reimbursing hospitals for these, which Medicare currently does not do, will increase their use over older antibiotics and in turn hopefully spur continued antimicrobial developments. This, of course, could lead to overprescribing, which the proposal addresses by requiring stewardship programs aiming to reduce inappropriate use and to improve tracking of how and why antibiotics are prescribed. In that same vein, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services now require hospitals participating in these programs to adopt antibiotic stewardship programs. Other organizations are pitching in as well. Groups like Pew and the Infectious Diseases Society of America are pushing for more economic incentives for antibiotic development. Pew has created the Shared Platform for Antibiotic Research and Knowledge, or SPARC, a virtual laboratory where scientists can share and build on each other's research and experiences rather than heading back to the starting block each time, perhaps unknowingly repeating steps that have already been taken. And there are things you can do to help too. When shopping for meat and poultry at the grocery store, you can choose labels like raised without antibiotics, increasing your own awareness and knowledge of the problem, and then spreading that to others like friends, family, and policymakers can have an enormous impact. Also, if you're taking antibiotics for a bacterial infection, it's very important to finish them even after you feel better. You're probably familiar with this advice and for good reason. Doing this ensures the demise of as much of the infection-causing bacteria as possible. We don't want a bunch of these bacteria hanging around to make you sick again and use their free time to develop immunity against the antibiotics you just exposed them to. There's been a question in recent years of whether current prescribed durations can be shortened such that the offending bacteria are killed while other risks are avoided. Ongoing research is working on answering that question, but in the meantime, patients should not make the decision to shorten prescription durations on their own. Dr. David Hyun, a senior officer working on the Antibiotic Resistant Project at Pew, recommends that if you have concerns, the best course of action is to talk to your doctor and allow them to weigh recent research data alongside their clinical findings to determine the safest course of action. And lastly, it's a common misconception that individual people become resistant to antibiotics when they make ill-advised decisions, such as prematurely discontinuing their prescriptions. But it's important to remember that it's the bacteria themselves that become resistant and thus untreatable when they infect any human. That's why spreading the word is especially important. Figuring this problem out will take all of us. Hey, did you enjoy this episode? Always helps if you like and subscribe down below. You might also enjoy this podcast episode we did talking to Dan Skrabonsky and Lily about developing drugs in general and how difficult it can be. We'd also like you to consider going to patreon.com slash healthcare trios and considering supporting the show in any way like our research associate Joe Sevitz or our Surgeon Admiral Sam. You can help us make the show bigger and better.